Hi, Clutter Fairy fans. This is the Clutter Fairy Weekly for June 14th, 2022. I'm your co-host, Ed Gumnick, and I'm speaking with Gail Goddard, certified professional organizer and owner of the Clutter Fairy in Houston, Texas. Hi, everybody. The Clutter Fairy Weekly is the webcast and podcast that digs deep into the clutter that piles up between you and the life you want to be living. We explore the habits and behaviors that lead to clutter, and we suggest strategies to slow the accumulation, reduce the collection, and comfortably manage the stuff we decide to keep. If you're new to our Zoom meeting, we're doing things completely different today anyway, so this is a good place for me to actually re <laughs> restate officially the guidelines we're giving today, which is we want as many people as possible to participate. If you appear on video, you will be included in the YouTube video that we publish unless you explicitly tell me that you don't want to. So turn off your video if you don't want to show up in the video. Also, if you know start to say something and you stumble over it or have any difficulty, feel free to just pause and start over because we're going to edit this episode carefully to make sure that you know we don't embarrass anyone. We will probably let as many as three or four people talk at once and hope you know, try not to talk over each other too much, but we want to make this as much as possible a conversation between all the people who are interested in answering a particular topic. We're also streaming live on Facebook, so you can share your questions and comments there, and I'll add them to the conversation. We're going to start, as we usually do, by reviewing the last weekly tittle, which was called You Make the Rules. The assignment was to design an algorithm for evaluating a category of clutter that gets you stuck. YouTube viewer Darlene shared an algorithm for a category that gives a lot of people trouble. Darlene says, my algorithms for photo collection were that I would toss out these photos. Number one, landscape pictures that weren't meaningful where I didn't recognize the place or didn't like the picture. Number two, pictures of people that only showed the backs of their heads or were blurry or where the people couldn't be seen well enough to be able to recognize individuals. The rare exception to this rule is for rare but not perfect photos, like the only picture we've been, been able to find of my great grandfather. Her third one was when I had multiple different pictures of the same thing slash event slash group of people taken at the same time, toss all but the best one or two Number four, are they truly sentimental? For example, my parents cleared out their photos and gave me a bunch of candid photos from their wedding. They kept the best ones. <laughs> these were not as good. Are these photos really sentimental to me or am I keeping them just out of a sense of obligation? I really love these algorithms, Darlene. Thank you so much for sharing them. They're practical, sensible ways to thin the herd of photos while at the same time capturing the photos that are valuable and special to you and your family like the photo, albeit blurry, of your great-grandfather. I especially like the rule about whether they are truly sentimental or not. Your example of the candids for your parents' wedding is a really, it's a perfect example. Your parents kept the best photos, which guess what? You'll inherit when they're gone. They sent you the runners-up photos because they couldn't bear to throw them out themselves, but they had already declared them not the best. So they've just given you the task of processing these photos now instead of when you inherit them. I think you can use your other algorithms on them and either thin them out substantially, or you can pick your favorites of these cast offs and let the rest go. They can hold the place for you until you inherit the collection that your parents curated as their favorites. You have four algorithms. They cover almost any photo that you might find, and it will definitely help you call out the collection to a size you're comfortable with keeping. Thank you so much for sharing that. That was very, very thorough very excellent example of creating other algorithms that work for you on a topic. Loved it. Kara said, I had a rule that I used. I have sheep fleeces stored in the garage for spinning. Some were given to me and I just threw them into storage. My rule was if there were too many second cuts, i.e. not the best for spinning, out the fleeces went. This helped assuage the guilt in getting rid of them finally. Yay, good job. And I know as a crafter, it's hard to like, you feel like you're throwing out supply, but if it's not the best supply and it's not what you would use, then sending it on, great idea. Somebody else would have wanted them and then they don't have to live in your storage facility, storage shed, storage room and get ignored. And so good for you. 
Okay, um, I think we should get right to our Dive main topic right because we have a lot to cover. We decided to cover the KonMari method in this episode because over the life of our show, we've seen so many comments and we've had lots of questions from participants about it. And their experiences have been all over the map. Since neither of us are experts in the KonMari method, we decided to talk with the people who've tried the techniques about how it worked for them or how it didn't. We've collected key quotations from her first book, The Life-Changing Magic of Tidying Up, The Japanese Art of Decluttering and Organizing, to get the conversation started and to give us a, a starting point to discuss how the methods worked for people who've tried them. So we're going get, to get started with that. We're going to start with, this is the survey that we sent out to everybody. And first, let me say thank you so much that everybody participated so thoroughly. And it's been very educational for me to read all of your comments and see how you experienced it. And I'm hoping to, now we're going to share, share it with your fellow uh, walkers through the talk. <laughs> and so <laughs> let's see what they have to say. What's the extent of your knowledge or experience with Marie Kondo and the KonMari method of organizing? We did ask that question. Yeah, we were curious about this because we wanted to sort of get a sense of how, you know, how much of our audience is familiar with Marie Kondo and, and her work. And 84% said that they have read one or more of the books. That's pretty impressive. 54% um, have watched one or both of her Netflix series. And 47% said that they combined elements of the KonMari method with other organizing philosophies or strategies. And, uh, I, and that's I reflected that was... in the comments too, that, that, that lots of people said, I do this piece and then I do these other things from these other people. And, and that combination helps me get organized. So this is out of the book, the first book. Let me share with you the secret of success. Start by discarding. Then organize your space thoroughly, completely in one go. If you adopt this approach, the KonMari method, you'll never revert to clutter again. So the question we asked was, have you successfully used the KonMari method to tidy your home? From this point on, we welcome your answers. I'm going to give some give answers from people who who gave us a response in their in their survey. But anyone else who would like to answer that this particular question, please put your hands up and, and we will call on you. One of the answers that we had that I really liked was, for me, this works really well because in the heart of heart, I am a person who loves very simple, clean lines, curated pieces that hold happy and significant memories. Anything else gets on my nerves and makes me grumpy. So what happened slash evolved with me now is that before I purchase something, I imagine it in my apartment. And if it gives me the feeling that it would take away from my beloved curated pieces, I hold it a bit in my hand, enjoy its beauty, and then send a little thank you to the universe to have shown me something so pretty. That's it. My heart and soul is happy, and I move on and get excited to go back home to my clutter-free home. That's pretty cool. That's kind of an application of... Marie Kondo to the world of shopping. Exactly. And I love that, you know, she's saying, I tested in my mind against the curated stuff at home. If it doesn't pass, I just enjoy the prettiness where it is and then leave it behind with a thank you. And that is awesome. And Linda has her hand up. Linda, go ahead. And the most important part of Marie Kondo to me is the very first sentence that you read. Start with discarding. And you also say that, Gail. Um, <laughs> I do. And I, that is the part of Marie Kondo that I've applied. Her methods did not apply very well to my situation, which is fine. I'm sure they work wonderfully for others. But that notion of discarding has to come first. And I've kept it as a high priority. And that part of it has really worked well for me. And the other thing I liked about Marie Kondo was just the whole crossing cultures aspect of it, that it was very different and it sparked lots of ideas in my mind. And I hope everybody can see my picture of the spark 
that I've got yeah. oh, instead yeah, yeah. of instead of my <laughs> face. Um, but if you look at the spark, what sparked joy for me and Marie Kondo is the discarding as the priority. And that's it. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you, Linda. Why don't you go on with the next question? Well, well I, Rowan has her hand up too. Oh, so great. Okay. Go in, Rowan. There um, we go. I think actually for me, the most important thing is sorting stuff to find out what you have and that um, a lot of people kind of panic about, I don't know what to get rid of because they actually don't know what they have. Right. And what happens in the sorting process is then your mind starts to work about, gee, I don't need this. Um, and that's it. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. That's a very good point. I, I think this whole process of getting organized is, is a process of examining what's actually there instead of ignoring what you've been stashing. <laughs> so this, her, her, uh, 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 burn and go method is is one way to get really clear about what you have okay we're going to go to the next question I think. go ahead samudra um the i like the um marie kondo uh discard first but lots of times i discard first in the abstract and when it comes to then when i combine with my my combine that method with my this is how much room i have I might have to discard more. And in that case, I might retrieve something from the earlier discard pile because two of that equals is one of this, you know, so it balances out. But I find that discarding by itself is too abstract an idea. And in practice, it turns out to be discard, organize, discard, organize, discard, organize, and things go <laughs> as, as the process. Things disappear as the process proceeds right okay so you're do, sort of doing it in rounds right you do mm -hmm. a round and then you exactly. add some more in a round and that works that's awesome okay we got linda up there what's happening linda while we wait for linda right. i'll say i'm just going to add that connie was uh, was who i was quoting from the survey a moment oh, okay. ago Thank go you. ahead linda um i my problem is with that is that i have hard time discarding um, unless I guess somebody was helping me out, I have a hard time doing that on my own. Um, and also uh, with the spark joy, I like so many things that I'd be keeping almost everything. That, so that is a theme that we've seen in the responses a lot. Yeah, so that's my problem with that. Um, and then I'd more likely to just say, I'll put it aside till later. And then it, it just never goes away. Um, and then some things, uh, you know, I, they might not spark joy or I love them, but, but I need them. You know, there's something you don't care for, like, like a toilet bowl brush or something like that, you know? Right, right, right. Someone you else gave, some, maybe it was your response, but, or someone else gave that very same example on the survey that a toilet bowl brush, it's like, yeah. it's not gonna, that's not gonna spark joy for a lot, a whole lot of people, but when, <laughs> when it's time to clean the toilet, it is, you certainly would be joyous, right joyless <laughs> without it. <laughs> that's true. We'll right? talk more about, we'll talk more about that topic when we get further further along but uh janice go ahead and hi everybody i bought us. this book in uh, can you hear me yes mm -hmm. okay i bought this book in 2016 in the middle of grad school and ordering other books that i needed for coursework and what did i do i read that book first three times <laughs> and filled up bags and bags and bags of clothes and emptied out a storage unit and um i I had lived briefly in Japan, so I had an idea of what she was talking about with the parameter of um, their little, what they call their apartments sometimes a rabbit hutch because it's so small and you have to, you can't live with a whole bunch of items. Mm -hmm. So um, I'm in my, I guess my second phase of uh, decluttering, I've donated books, maybe 70 books or so to a philanthropic group. I recommend that. Uh, they have a book sale, uh, old VHS movies or DVDs. Some people still have the, the VCRs and those kinds of things. Mm -hmm. But I really recommend if you cannot afford the book, it's not very expensive, go to your public library. 
because they have it. And um, they also have some additional books that she has written. Um, other than that, I, it was so inspirational. Uh, when I finished my, um, my final project for university, um, I went to town all the whole summer. I was just unpacking things and uh, donation. It was donation time. So if you don't use it, get rid of it. <laughs> There's nothing like a move to, you know, force hey. you to thin everything out. And I'm glad that the book was helpful to allow you to do that in a very successful way. That's awesome. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Miss Christy in Connecticut. Oh, hi. Hi, Gail and everybody else. I, I just think your program is marvelous. Oh, thank um, you, Christy. You're welcome. But um, okay, so I want to, I agree with some of the people on discarding. I have a lot of trouble with that. But I mean, the initial thing of just throwing out trash, that's not a problem there. You know, if, if it's broken, if it's stained, if it's, you know, just get rid of it, you know, but then there's the things of like, I, I kind of almost needed an algorithm for the, you know, what to do with the rest of it, because then there are things I don't want or need. And, and if I know that initially, I try, to, I try to move that to a separate thing. And, um, and then there are things that I don't know what the heck they are. Um, usually they're from my late husband. I have no idea where they go to or what, sometimes even what they do. Sometimes I spend a little time and try to figure that out. But, um, but sometimes I think I should, if I don't know what they are at this point, I should just move them on um, because I don't need them. So, um, so there's those categories. So, um, so I think what with me, I think too much about it. And I think sometimes I need to just kind of make some quick things. So that's why I, I'm just trying to categorize it a little bit so I can quickly just decide. And then of those things that I didn't actually just toss, then I can decide, do you wanna just bring them down to the transfer station with a little shed that, you know, that people can pick up stuff that are still good or, or do you want to give them to somebody or whatever, you know? So then you decide what to do or bring the books to the library or, you know, that kind of stuff. Um, but, um, but I think, I think I have to, you know, to somehow quickly do this or I sit there and I, and I agonize over it too much, you know? Yeah. And, and if you get stuck in the agonizing, that's very discouraging, right? It like really mm -hmm. shuts you down. So it is something to manage when you start feeling that you're spiraling in your conversation, or I mean, in your decision making, it's good to, you know, pause and go do something else if you get stuck there, because you can sort of spiral yourself down into complete inertia if you're not careful. And maybe it just means it's time to stop for the day when you find yourself uh, fighting that hard to make decisions. Right. And that, that's why I think that a whole idea of the algorithm is a good one because you can have your, you know, it, you the can rules, right? Get category, right. And then, and then you can, one of the categories could be, these are things that I don't want, but I'll decide what to do with them in the next, you know, in the next tomorrow or something, you know? Um, so yeah, that exactly. helps that move it through, you know? Great, so. Christy. Thank you. I appreciate it. Thank you. Hey, Gil, let's go to the next no, no, no. Oh, Smoodra has something to oh, say. Oh, jump back in. If you were in doubt about something, just kind of put it in an in doubt about it pile and see if the perfect opportunity to give it to somebody doesn't walk by. I had a Corona del Sol accordion that's been sitting in around for 12 years and the bells are broken and I can't play it. And the guy who was cutting the grass out back for the apartment building suddenly this is not an ethnic thing. He just suddenly looked to me like somebody who might appreciate it of an accordion. And I grabbed and ran up and said, can you play this? And I wouldn't get <laughs> it to him until he opened it up and showed me that he could play it. And I get, then I gave it to him. And I, and I also, my Japanese rice pot, I know somebody who cooks Asian who's just moving in. And I think it's about to go in the crock pot today. So if you wait for the, the right... Things you can't decide in your head. If you wait for the right moment, your heart will open and say, no, no, to this person. <laughs> mm -hmm. That's a good solution. That's a good try. Thanks, Samudra. All right, we moving on to the next question? Yes. Okay, so here's the first one, the quotation number two that came out of the book. I begin my course with these words. Tiding is a special event. Don't do it every day. So we asked the question in the survey, have you been able to treat tidying as a special event and sufficiently maintain your environment 
And then the follow-up question was, do you heed the advice not to declutter every day? We had about 70% of people said no to have you been able to treat tidying as a special event. And uh, about 12% of people said yes. And then uh, the rest said (laughs) said some form of other, you know, um, meaning yes, but, (laughs) or no, but. And on the follow-up question, do you heed the do you heed the advice to not declutter every day? Twenty-seven um, percent said yes, fifty-three percent no, and there were lots of other examples, uh, lots of other answers on the other. I declutter when I find something that I don't choose to keep. I don't declutter every day, but I try to make room to use the corner of my computer table so I can have a flat surface to write on. Go ahead, Deborah. Um, as far as the question goes, um, I appreciate the Conmary thought of uh, not decluttering every day, but that's because I think some people are marathoners and some people are sprinters, and I'm a sprinter, so I um, will get frustrated with a particular area. Sorry, there's a bunch of background noise. Um, and I will completely um declutter that area but i don't have a problem maintaining that because the decisions have been made and going back to i think Samutra's comment um about um organizing or having difficulty getting rid of certain things i think that's part of the genius of the con marie way is that you go with whatever has the least um emotional connection first and she suggests clothes, but that only works if somebody's not into fashion. So if somebody's really into fashion, then um, clothes are emotionally deep. Maybe they should start with books. But uh, I like the specific order, and that makes it easier. Anyway. Thanks. Thanks, Deborah. What about Sophia? Okay. Hello. Good afternoon. Um, so for me, first of all, going back to what Christy said on the previous question, it's like my whole family has that issue of sorting things. We have a lot of stuff, each like individual. But um, on the current question for me, I'm like kind of halfway. It's with my job, it's easier for me to do it. Like I can schedule like a couple of days in a row, but like right now, more than a couple of days in a row being summertime out of the school, um, out of the classroom for the summer. Right, right, right. Uh, it's just hot. It's so hot. <laughs> My- it's so hot. <laughs> well, and the thing is that, you know, I mean, if I had it all here with me, that would be one thing. But just living situation is kind of funny right now, looking for a place to live. So most of my stuff is in storage. So mm. it's hot outside. And I, um, but I went at nighttime where it was cooler. And then um, I was happy with what I got done, but I'm sitting around thinking about it all day. You know, like it is like a special time. I've, I've planned this time. I'm going to go do this. And you get there and you're like, hey, who put all this stuff in here? <laughs> <laughs> who put that stuff in storage anyway? What? If they loaded it at night when I'm not looking, what's happening? <laughs> right. <laughs> is it breeding and multiplying in there? It felt like it. And I, I'm very, I am organized, even though I have a lot of stuff. I, yeah. I did, since I did move and that's how the stuff got in storage. Long story short, I moved into a place and I was there for a full five days, not even a whole seven day week. The maintenance people tried to break in and take stuff. And I was like, uh-uh. Ooh. So I had to go right back to storage. Oh my goodness. So that's oh my what that situation goodness. is right now. But um, so in that case, some of the stuff just kind of got tossed in there in a hurry. Cause I was yeah. like, I can't stay living here. Um, but so like right now it's kind of going in and pulling that stuff out and putting it back in in an organized way. And as I go through, I'm sorting in. Uh, another lady said something about, you know, the obvious trash, you just you just throw the trash away. So um, it's like that. And the part of the moving where I was able to do it in a focused way, then I was able to label boxes and containers as I went. So that's helpful. That helped. Um, I, it's, it's also important, I think, there is an element of, when it goes in storage, then you are sort of separated from it and it stops feeling, it doesn't have the same level of attachment because you're not living with it all the time. Mm-hmm. And so there's a little bit of, 
you know, separation I'm, makes it easier. I think I'm using, I'm using that. So some days right. I'm like, okay, I haven't, I haven't even used it in all this time. Do I need it? So thank you yeah. for reminding. I am using that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it gives you an extra element of uh, ability to filter because of the separation. That's good. Thanks yeah. for sharing, Sophia. Thank you. Thank hey, you. Let me, let me jump in for a second and say, Nancy, who's, who's w watching on Facebook, said the KonMari method seems overwhelming to me. I can't imagine pulling out all my papers or photos all at once. And and that, that, that seems to me like a response to the special event idea. That, that was kind of my reaction when she talked about trying to do it all in one go was I could not possibly take off the however many weeks of my life it would take to organize everything all at once. I know it's you, a little shocking, isn't it? Do you get that response from people a lot? Yes. And, and, and reaching that overwhelm is everybody has their own threshold of where they're overwhelmed, but she's also still a young woman. <laughs> so the, the older you get, the less, you know, energy you have for all day tackling, right? Like it gets to be harder and harder. And when you work with an organizer, for instance, and somebody comes in and, and we're concentrating on it for three hours straight, it's three hours of me and three hours of the person, the client that I'm working with. So it's six man hours of work. And at the end of that three hours, most of my clients are like, I am wiped out. That is as much as I got for this. I cannot face it for another minute. And so, you know, you better be a high energy person to do all your clothes in one go from start to finish. Yeah. That's, <laughs> that's my experience. And Michelle in uh, England has things to say. Hi, Michelle. Hi. Yeah. The whole idea of waiting for one fine day fills me with panic. It just sounds like a prelude to a disaster <laughs> right. because I don't have time to set aside for a mission like that. I mean, I, I tend to, sort things as I go along. So I went away a few weeks ago and I was packing my suitcase thinking, oh, I'll take this, put this on. Oh, can't wear that outside. Um, and as I was doing that, I mounted six dresses, four tops and a pair of shorts. And it was just something I could do while I did something I needed to do. So you were already in the closet, time. right? Like while you were already in there moving clothes Absolutely. around, right? Yeah. If you so can't good, take it on holiday, on you. take it, uh, you know, dovetail it. That's good. Yeah. That's great. And it's exactly the, like, it was a chore that wasn't too big. It wasn't too much. It was something that you could yeah. say. Yeah. If I'd have tried to, to do everything all in one go, though, it, it just wouldn't be possible or practical with, with everyday life. Right. And the funny thing is I've watched the television show and she um, pulls, helps them pull all the clothes out and looks at all of it and starts doing the work and sorting, sorting, sorting. And you know that there's like many, many hours of, and then she goes away and leaves them to finish <laughs> to keep going, you know, and it's, oh, like, no. oh my God, that must be so exhausting. It must have taken them for forever. And I think she's very enthusiastic she really likes the work and so for her it's like this fun and fabulous project and for a lot of people it's very daunting and distressing instead and so she comes to it with a lot more enthusiasm than most people because she likes the work like I do and so she can look at a closet and it's completely full and go whoa this is awesome and not realizing that her clients are going kill me kill me now okay yeah. <laughs> Bella has a comment I think part of that is also just the shock factor and also makes you realize how much of the same item that you have and it helps you discard it easier. So I do appreciate that part. Right? Like it helps you prioritize pant, black pant number one versus black pant number 27. Right? You forget how many times you bought black pants and put them in the closet. When you bring them all out and lay them out, you're like, oh my God, there's 27 black pants in here. Yeah. It's absolutely true. And it happens in my clients a lot when we I empty out the cabinets in the kitchen and I'm like, I just keep pulling stuff out and pulling stuff out and pulling stuff out. And, and the response is always, oh my God, how is that? Where did it, was all that stuff in there? Like, yeah, yeah. And we're going through it today. And so 
I don't do the whole kitchen. I do these three cabinets and we go through everything in those three cabinets and move along. And, you know, sometimes we can get all the way through and sometimes we can't. Bella, did you have something else to add? Just that, does she ever put like a time limit on it or it's like just open-ended? Not, not that I've seen. Although when she was, when the, in the show, when she's working with clients, she like comes and works and she's clearly there for some time. And then mm -hmm. she goes away and leaves them with homework to finish that particular thing and then comes back another day. And it seems like it isn't like she comes back the next day. Oh, and she's, Deborah says, the book says to do it over six months. Okay. Would that, would that get there for everybody? <laughs> I don't know the answer to that question. Okay, Sophia, you're next. Yes, um, not to be funny, but how many pairs of black pants is sufficient? <laughs> 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 right you'd be surprised how many people like i've had that conversation a million times i've had it one like oh. okay but i need those plant those pants are to go to church those pants are to go to dinner those pants are to work in the yard those pants like they all have assignments and Reserved so you, for funerals. <laughs> you're right yeah like you know it's like okay all right so then let's like there's just a pile of things to go out except that you only go out once a year. So you probably don't need eight pants to go out. You can probably just have one. You know, we have that conversation. Okay. So you just, <laughs> well, you just described it the way I do it. It's just, I, I look at like stuff for the, for outside, for the yard or whatever, stuff for work, stuff for church and the stuff for work in church is kind of really the kinda same. The same, so, right? Yeah. Yeah, yes. exactly. Okay. Yeah. Thank, Thank you. you. <laughs> Thanks, Sophia. Uh, Kathy R is up next. Um, hi there. Hi, Gail. Hi, everybody. Hi. Um, I'm kind of new to you the last couple months and just love, just love you. Love everybody who's here collectively trying to deal with our stuff. Thank um, you. Welcome to the community. Thank you. It's just wonderful. And, um, uh, just a comment on what I heard about, I've got the closet from hell too. It's, you know, six feet deep and you open the door <laughs> and I mean that you can't get anything else in it. And, um, I'm, I'm, I'm overloaded. You know, I, I have no more room. I have. Yeah. So, um, I haven't gotten into that closet for like five years and I'm just continuing to hear what I'm hearing today as well, that almost anything in there should be able to go because I haven't used it. Cause you haven't seen it. Cause you haven't worn it. Even it's though not on your radar, Yeah, I know that there's a brand new crock pot still in the box that's been in there for 20 years um i keep thinking i'm going to do crock pot cooking yeah i gotta I think, let it go i think you've gotten the vote on that which is it's staying in the closet for 20 years which means it's a good idea that you don't actually want to execute yes, <laughs> right? yes. so so um yeah so thank you and i'm just going to tell myself it's got to go so and it'll be you. brand new and somebody that finds it when you go take it to donation and they put it out to sell it for a fraction of what it costs yeah and somebody will find it and feel like they got the deal of the century exactly what they needed they'll be perfectly happy with it yeah. and you know it won't be in your closet anymore space is such a premium and i every every one of my surfaces is cluttered so yeah so right. i'm well, learning I'm glad you're here Thanks. and we are going to be here and help you get rid of that we have all been in this place right you guys know what she's talking about so we're here to support you <laughs> thank you okay I'm going to the next question. I'll, I'll quote. read the quotation. When you tidy your space completely, you transform the scenery. The change is so profound that you feel as if you were living in a totally different world. This deeply affects your mind and inspires a strong aversion to reverting. That's a pretty strong quote. I have to say that is like, she is declaring, if you, if you could do this completely, you change your mind and and you have an aversion to getting having it de, uh, get cluttered again and she's sort of declaring that as truth so the first question we asked is do you did you feel that your space was transformed when your project was complete and please elaborate and then please share your experience of how your life and your thinking has been changed by pursuing the method or ways in which it has not we had a really good answer uh, uh, a really thought-provoking answer on this one from jm who said yes 
but it didn't last because the space was transformed, but I wasn't. I find the faster I clear something out, the more likely I am to revert. The open space seems emotionally empty and it's too easy to fill it up again, putting something down temporarily. When I empty a space more gradually, I become accustomed to a new set point and both notice and feel driven to attend to anything that is out of place. I, I like that answer because I one of my own uh, re re responses or reactions to Marie Kondo. I, I read the book. I've read the book about two and a half times. I, I two times completely, and then I kind of skimmed it again as I've been preparing for this. Um, is that I, I don't think that specially so-called special event organizing creates habits that keep you from returning to a cluttered state. And there is a shock value if you do it all at once and suddenly there's a whole bunch of clear space. And I get feedback from clients when I'm working with them a lot, like we'll empty out a cabinet and we'll only put three things back in it and suddenly there's all this space and the first thing they'll say to me is oh look at all this space i can put things in there like no that is not why we did this project it is not so that you can add it in it's so that you can live with the empty space for a little while and see what that's like um i think it's not unusual what she's describing as um if you clear it all up at once your immediate response is to oh look here's free space for me to put things in and if you do it more slowly over time you do adjust to a different density of clutter clutter like you you adjust to a density of your space as being thinner and thinner and thinner but you do it slowly over time and so you get uh, used to it easier i think that's a good observation it was it was one of my um one of the quotes to this question I thought was really, one of the answers to this question I thought was really fascinating. Diane on you on uh, Facebook said, sometimes when I see something I haven't seen for five, five years, it's like a happy reunion instead of letting it go. Right, when you find it again, you remember it's there, it's true. And uh, what are you gonna do? You're still trying to uh, thin the herd. So if you find long lost friends that you still have to keep, that's fine. And you still are, the ultimate goal is still to let go of some of the stuff that you're finding. So if you find something that you've been looking for for the last decade, awesome. <laughs> and hopefully that won't be 100% of what you find. Okay. Now, so we, we have, we also got some very positive answers to the, to the same question about uh, transforming the, the, the scenery and yeah. uh, um, a change that makes you feel as you live your, as if you're living in a totally different world. Um, one respondent said, yes, the progress at the end felt great. All the open space was uplifting and having group like categories all stored in one place was really nice. Um, another said, it feels less cluttered. I wouldn't describe it as transformed. <laughs> and another said, there is a point of transformation, but I haven't seen it that many times in my journey, maybe because I haven't done the process to completion all at once. If you're trying to um, notice a transformation for the whole space and not feeling like you haven't gotten complete and so you're not arriving there, this is where we talk about, you know, focus on the one area and see the difference in the one area. If you can see whether that one area has been transformed for you when you work on that area to completion, that drawer, that countertop, that cabinet, and live with that cabinet change 100% and see whether that feels transformative to you when you're done. Um, it might be an interim way to gauge and sort of help and support you on the journey. Linda says, retaking it all out at once. If you can't get through it at once, you're creating another mess that can be depressing to view. Yeah. Thus, I use a measured approach. If I have an hour or two, then I pick a section or drawer that I can accomplish in the time I have. And um, at least one person responding to the survey said, I, I pulled everything out in a particular category and ha then moved it into the hall and then didn't have the energy to finish the project so now i have a room that's a wreck and a hallway that's also a wreck yeah sorry <laughs> that is you know i do have to tell people it always looks worse before it looks better like when we start um, deconstructing a room 
it there's there's usually as a room is slowly filled with stuff you've been putting things away you've been making stacks you you know there's there, even in the chaos there's a little bit of logic oh that's when i put all those boxes there that's when the company came and i swept the stuff out of the living room that's the corner where i brought home stuff from school and and there's a little bit of logic to the piles at least but when i start dismantling a room like that it always looks way worse before it looks before it starts to resolve and so i have to remind people yes i'm i'm unbuilding what little order and sense of um uh, placement that you created in order to look through it all and find what's going to stay and then put back what actually needs to be there instead of just stashing the stuff in piles in this room and so um, that process it is very destructive <laughs> it is very destructive and it's another reason why the idea of doing all the clothes or all of the books in the house is daunting because if you pull them all out and pile them on the floor you may have used all your energy just to make the pile and then you're like done for the day and you have to live with that chaos and so mm -hmm. it is something you have to agree that however many days it's going to take you to get through the process you agree to live with the, the disruption until hey, the destruction until it's resolved you definitely have to have a, a, a realistic plan for I'm going to dedicate the next, you know, this many hours, the next two weeks or whatever you're, whatever you think will do it for you and, and really commit to it. If you're going to do an entire category at once or all of the categories in your home and in, in one short period, Janice has unmuted herself now. Um, are you, are you there, Janice? Yeah, you, I'm unmuted. I think. Okay. Talk to us. <laughs> yeah. One of, one of the, um, things that trips up people, according to Marie, is mementos, all these little chastis and knickknacks that people give you. And my comment to be to be with that would um, keep the love and get rid of the item. That's a really. great quote. I mean, Good you just, job. You just can't, that you can't hang on to everything. You cannot you know? hang on to everything. You just and cannot. And I've, I came across you and Ed a couple of months ago because they're doing construction in my home <laughs> oh, and i had to clean out uh, a, a major closet with some storage in it and um i'm in the middle at the end of that actually and so i put you and ed on on the podcast on youtube and listen to you guys while i'm uh, working <laughs> and it just keeps me going i appreciate Yay, it i'm so glad we do and you're not the only one that does that we are the silent partners for a lot of people on the podcast. We yeah. appreciate you know being there and, and supporting you in abstentia. Yeah, I appreciate you. And of course. Thank you. Thanks for sharing. Rowan, you got your hand up? I think the Marie Kondo principle of sorting by, by category is really great, but one doesn't have to do all the clothes. One can just do one's summer shorts or in the kitchen, just do the um your cooking utensils but gathering all of one particular type of thing together um is really important you know do all your lingerie um and and so make progress thank you that, that, thank you that is her point exactly right that you make better decisions if you are looking at the entirety of a specific item so that you know that you have 35 bras and you can make good priority judgments about these are better than those these I only wear one time a year this one is not pleasant to wear i don't like it and so you are better able to make your choices if you're looking at the full population and so um, that's really what she's advocating by saying pull all the clothes from everywhere out and go through them all it's that you you need to know a how big the pile is and how much is in it and how many pairs of black pants you have 100% so that when you're making your choices, you're comparing them all against each other and you can trust your choice as being the best possible choice because you've looked at 100% of what you have. And so you know you're making, you're, you're picking the best out of all of them and not missing one. And that way you feel good about, okay, this is 100%, this is the entirety of what I own in, fill in the blank. And I can compare them all to each other 
and decide which ones are at the top of the heap and keep those. And then when you let the others go, you feel comfortable because you know you've kept all the best ones. And that's, you know, it's a great thought process, even if she applies it to a category that maybe is bigger than the average person can handle, you can certainly use that process in a smaller subcategory. It's a great idea. Thank you. Miss Marshmallow has her hand up. Hi. Um, <clears throat> thank you. Uh, <clears throat> this is uh, deep emotions for me. I like the dirty details that we all go through, Gail, Ed, and everyone. I also like her um, books and what she's offered us over the years. What my um, thankfulness is, and I try to express it, is that we, the emotions for me are very deep and entrenched. Um, uh, doing one item for me has, and then listening to all of you and working with the Clutter Fairy and as we progress, is the freedom. And that's what I'd like to hear more of what we all talk about is now we are giving the freedom to make that choice clearly without the, you know, the chatter in our heads and each area of our lives, which is our homes. I have freedom now, everybody, where I didn't have it even just a few weeks ago or a few months ago. I look at my piles. I look at my clutter. I know what's behind it now. For me, it's safety. And it's the freedom in my head and in my heart to choose I will keep this, I can donate that, I can clean that, I can hang that, I can use that, I can buy this or not buy this. That's the beauty of what I think we're all doing. And I'm for, I just go to the emotions. I am a sappy person that way. It's just the freedom I have now. I never had that before, the freedom to choose and make the choice for myself. And I thank you all. And that's all I wanted to say. So Thank That's you. awesome. Thank you. Thank you for sharing. I think it's a very good point that you, you, there is a freedom in making the choice of what is most supportive to you and not trying to keep up with stuff that doesn't support you and isn't part of your, um, you know, improving your life and making your life richer. And that's an excellent way to think of it. Thank you for sharing. Okay. Where are we? Um, the question next question is please share your experience of how your life and your thinking have been changed by pursuing the KonMari method or ways in which it has not mm -hmm. i like this one from paula a lot i was really struck by marie's respect for items and how they support one's life on page 80 she discusses proper folding and storage of socks most people probably think she's bonkers but i see her as saying that even the most mundane item should be treated with respect I will note that I fold socks differently than her, but do have them standing in the drawer. And, and it, the point being that she recognizes that everything, everything that's important enough to keep is also important enough to have a system and to have a way to store it and to have that way to be easy and uh, useful and supporting how you get dressed in the morning or how you make food or how you entertain yourself that all of those things that you want to keep, it makes sense to have a system that makes it easy to manage the things that you decide to keep. And it's a very good point. Absolutely. This may actually also still be Paula. Page yes. 108 has a quote that really resonated with me. The true purpose of a present is to be received. Yes, yes, yes. There's no need to keep something just because someone gave it to me. I have also turned this around somewhat. For instance, if someone, something catches my eye in a store, I now say that its purpose was to have me admire it then and there, and I don't feel the need to buy it. Oh, I like that. I like that a lot. Doesn't that make the store crazy? But, <laughs> but it's perfectly, uh, perfectly lovely for you to admire it in the moment, to be in the now, and to see the item and admire its interest, its beauty, whatever catches your eye, and, and it's fulfilling its purpose just by having you notice it. And you can be thanking it and blessing it and moving on without buying it. <laughs> That's well, a great idea. And someone in the chat a little while ago said, and I, I apologize, there are so many messages there, I'll never be able to find it. And it, and Zoom does not have a function to search the chat. Um, note to Zoom, please add that. <laughs> but someone said um, what they 
one of the things they, I'm paraphrasing, one of the things they liked about Marie Kondo is shifting the emotion involved from fear to gratitude. Mm-hmm. That her emphasis is on picking up each item and either determining that it still sparks joy or whatever that means to you. Um, so you keep it or that it no longer does and then you thank it and let it go. Um, that part feels very emotion, very emotionally healthy to me. Right. To be, and to be thinking of it in terms of it, the idea that if you're thanking it for it, what it's provided to you up to this point, you're sort of being grateful for the use that you got out of it and thanking it for that. I got this amount of use from this object and isn't that wonderful. And I can pass the remaining use on to the next person and let it go. And it can, you know, leave my hands and go on. And I, re- it's, it's a great positive, um, much more uh, happy emotion, emotional way to look at it than being depressed about the loss and the letting go. And, the <laughs> you know, it's just, you're looking at it from the same, you're looking at it just from a different point of view. And it's one that makes your mind um, relax and be at peace instead of being distressed. And I really appreciate that about her sentiments about that. Christine, okay. go ahead. Oh, I just wanted to say I agree with you on the respect and gratitude. I thought that was a real strong thing um, of of her teachings um, because I think you don't want to feel like you've wait. I don't feel like I'm wasting things, and and the fact that you may have learned something from it helps you let it go. Um, and I also uh, the folding thing that they had. I thought that was crazy at first, but then I started doing it. You know, like doing it to show gratitude and. And also I discovered that it's, it's a way of seeing what you have, because if it's in a drawer, it tends to be in stacks and you can't see what's underneath the top thing. So this shows all the colors. It shows the only thing I have a problem with is like the shirts, like long and short sleeve shirts. So how I solved that was I only put the long sleeve shirts in one place and the short sleeve shirts in another. So, so, and I categorize color actually, um, so, so that, so I, I thought that was really good. So I find sometimes when I clean things out and Gail was mentioning this earlier too, about to the, you know, our clients that wanted to fill the space is that to try to have the concept of always leaving negative space, um, you know, both for, you know, the unexpected buys at the grocery store or whatever. So you have additional space, you don't have it crammed in. And um, I find when I pack things, my two things are, um, you know, um, being able to see what I have and being able to get them out easily. And if I can't do those two things, then I need to rethink the whole process there that I need to get rid of more stuff or, or I, I'm not, it's not, that's not going to, that's not going to work because if I find if I can't get them out easily, unless it's something that's only used once a year or something, but I'm not going to use it. So you might as well get rid of it. Right. So, if it's too hard to get it out, if it's too hard to put it away after it's clean, that's mm-hmm. the biggest, I mean, think about how people pull the Christmas decorations out and they set up Christmas, they take it down and they get it back into the boxes and then they have to like unbuild and rebuild the attic or the garage in order to get the, the Christmas stuff put away. And so then it, it's too hard to put it up and they leave it out for six months just in, and put it away just in time to turn around and take it back out again. So there, there is that need to make it be thin enough, the contents easy enough to get in and to get out. So when you pull it out, you can use it, you clean it, you put it back, and it can't be something that has you have to work super hard at because that's a barrier to entry. It'll just it just slows you down and it makes you less likely to use the energy to do it if it take if it's too long in the in the restocking. And there are people who they love that stacking nesting process. They love filling the cube in a particular order and it all fits in if it just goes in exactly one way. And they love restacking it and making that happen. But if you don't have that natural inclination, I have clients that are like they take the cube and they fill it up until it's 100% full and to the edges and they're so proud of the stacking of it. And it's like, okay, but every time you take one thing out, you, you destroy the Tetris cube. 
you destroy the Rubik's cube and you have to, you know, put it back together in a specific way. Now, if that's entertaining to you, then you will go through the process and put it up. But if that's not your, how your mind works, if you don't get enjoyment out of that process, then making it too dense to put away easily is going to stop you in your tracks. And then it'll all stay out. <laughs> and that is defeating the purpose, I think. Thank you. Christine. Okay, we have, this is such a great conversation, but it is already after 1 p.m. And we still need to tell you about, well, obviously next week, we're going to do more of the same. We're going to continue with this topic because we have lots, lots and lots more good responses to talk about. And right. uh, this is obviously, this obviously stimulates a lot of thought for everybody. Um, so let's talk about the tittle. Okay, so we designed a, a dovetail tittle, and it's called Tokimeku. So Kathy Hirano, who is the person who translated the first Marie Kondo book into English, and she offered several other phrases as alternative uh, translations for the word sparking joy, what she translated into the word sparking joy. So this week's assignment is to select a small category of stuff and ask yourself these alternative questions that she offered. Does this inspire joy? Does this bring you pleasure? Do you feel a thrill when you touch mm -hmm. it? Does it speak to your heart? Does it brighten your world? Does it make you happy? So these are alternative translations for what she um, actually uh, ultimately put into the book as sparking joy. And maybe speaking to your heart or feeling a thrill when you touch it, it will resonate better for you than the original translation. So pick a couple of things in your house, uh, pull those, uh, put those questions against the item and see if it passes muster under uh, those new questions. And uh, then come back in next week and tell us how it went. If you've already sparked joy your whole house, then you can just come and tell us how it went for you on your, uh, in your experience, your vast experience. <laughs> okay. If you're watching this on YouTube, we would love for you to join us live and you can join us next week for the ongoing conversation about Marie Kondo. Right. To get, to get notifications about upcoming events, we invite you to join the meetup group by visiting cfhou.com slash meetup. We are, by the way, coming up on 3,000 members in the meetup meet group. Woo -woo. Yeah. Yay. Okay. You can also follow us on Facebook by visiting cfhou.com slash Facebook or join our mailing list by visiting cfhou.com slash subscribe. We love to hear from you. So please keep sending us your questions, comments, and topic suggestions on YouTube, Facebook, or anywhere else that you find us. You can always find us through our website at clutterfairhouston.com. Thanks. I wanted to say thank you to the uh, one person sent an email and said that she finally joined our mailing list because of the Marie Kondo topic because she wanted to listen and hear about that so badly and she wanted to make sure she didn't miss the notification for it so thank you for joining the mailing list because of Marie Kondo and um, we are going to continue this conversation clearly we have way more to talk about it and we look forward to doing that next week with you guys thanks for sharing today we really appreciate it bye-bye bye, -bye. bye.